I want to welcome everybody to tonight's class. This is the People's School for Master's Learning Studies. Today is Thursday, October 1st. We're continuing and finishing the book that we've been using for the last two or three weeks called The United Front by George Dimitrov, a Bulgarian communist. We're starting on page 64 in the PDF. That's Consolidation of the Communist Parties and Struggle for Political Unity of the Proletariat. All right, comrades, we're going to be starting on page 64. The Consolidation of the Communist Parties and the Struggle for Political Unity of the Proletariat. Comrades, in the struggle to establish the United Front, the importance of the leading role of the Communist Party increases extraordinarily. Only the Communist Party is at bottom the initiator, the organizer, and the driving force of the united front of the working class. The Communist Parties can ensure the mobilization of the widest masses of working people for a united struggle against fascism and the offensive of capital only if they strengthen their own ranks in every respect. If they develop their initiative, pursue a Marxist-Leninist policy, and apply correct, flexible tactics, which take into account the actual situation and alignment of class forces. Consolidation of the Communist Parties. In the period between the 6th and 7th Congresses, our parties in the capitalist countries have undoubtedly grown in stature and have been considerably steeled but it would be a most dangerous mistake to rest content with the achievement. The more the united front of the working class extends, the more will new, complex problems rise before us, and the more will it be necessary for us to work on the political and organizational consolidation of our parties. The united front of the proletariat brings to the fore an army of workers who will be able to carry out their mission if this army is headed by a leading force which will point out its aims and path. This leading force can only be a strong proletarian revolutionary party. If we communists exert every effort to establish a united front, we do this not for the narrow purpose of recruiting new members for the Communist parties, but we must strengthen the Communist parties in every way and increase their membership for the very reason that we seriously want to strengthen the United Front. The strengthening of the Communist parties is not a narrow party concern, but the concern of the entire working class. The unity, revolutionary solidarity, and fighting preparedness of the Communist parties constitute most valuable capital, which belongs not only to us, but the whole working class. We have combined and shall continue to combine our readiness to march jointly with the social democratic parties and organizations to the struggle against fascism with an irreconcilable struggle against social democracy as the ideology and practice of compromise with the bourgeoisie and consequently, also against any penetration of this ideology in our own ranks. In boldly and resolutely carrying out the policy of the United Front, we meet in our own ranks with obstacles which we must remove at all costs in the shortest possible time. I'll stop there for questions, comrades. Do social democratic parties count as workers' parties? Yes, they do. They definitely do. The German social democratic party was one of the largest. The Russian social democratic party was also large before it split into Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. Yeah, they count as workers' parties. While they count as workers' parties, social democracy as an ideology, however, is not a worker's ideology. A social democratic party is a worker's party. Only if they follow Marxist-Leninism are they actually a worker's party. I'd like to differ on that. According to all my readings, 
They don't have to be Marxist-Leninists. They have to be Marxist. That's and correct. I'm sorry. Yes, that's correct. That's why Karl Kautsky, the Fremen German Social Democrat, and others in the Russian Social Democratic Party were considered workers' parties, even though they were not Marxist-Leninists. They were Marxists. They can be workers' parties even if they're incorrect. So when we're talking about social democratic parties and workers' parties, obviously the contemporary political parties in the United States, the Democratic and Republican Party, they have major voting blocks that are working class people, but obviously the direction of the party is not working class. So in order for a party to be social democratic or working class, is it based on the constituency of the voters or is it based on the direction of the leadership? From my understanding, I'll answer it, my understanding, it's the Marxist ideology. And that's where the leadership gets it from. That's my understanding. I don't know if I answered your question. You did. I'm just trying to tie it to our contemporary political system, and I didn't know if the Democratic Party ever at what point would no, be considered no. by Marxists. Okay. No, that's what, that definitely not. Definitely not. Okay, that's, we, that's what I The left has been trying to build a labor party in this country for God knows how many years. They started with the former labor party during the William Z. Forster period in certain parts of the country. They only had it in certain parts of the country. We had attempted to form a social democratic party, which was the progressive party in the late 40s. We tried, were involved with labor party advocates in the early 90s. England has a labor party. So England has a social democratic party that's considered a workers party. It sounds like they're advocating strictly, you can't substitute any of your ideology for social democracy, but what place then does social democratic parties serve today? Because it seems like contemporarily in America right now, they have pretty mass support. They obviously don't go far enough, but how do you see that fitting in with the overall communist movement in America? We do not have a social democratic party here yet. DSA is not even a party. It's a formation, what we would call a pre-party formation. If and when DSA forms a party, they will probably be the first social democratic party in this country in my lifetime. Does that answer you at all? Well, so then when the DSA is a party, do we unify with them moving towards... No, uh, it's, it depends. We're talking about this is a book that was written that says the times changed in 1935 than they were in 1933 in Europe and in the world. So the communist movement changed its tactics because the reality changed. In this country, I cannot predict what will happen in the future. So it depends on the reality. It depends on what's going on. So I can't really give you an answer to that. We can work with them. We can work against them. It depends on the period of time. With DSA, one of the issues is that they actually refuse to work with parties like ours. It's actually against their constitution. They're not allowed to work with democratic centralist parties. It's against the constitution for them to do that. And I'd also like to quickly say that the closest thing that we do have to a Democratic Socialist Party would be the SPUSA, the Socialist Party of America. They're the closest thing that we have, but they don't really participate in any meaningful way. All I had to say was to bring up the Socialist Party USA and that they're the closest thing we have to a Social Democratic Party, or I believe they call themselves Democratic Socialists. Yeah, in the left... There's a difference between democratic socialists and social democrats. There is a slight difference. Social democrats, as we had in Germany, the difference between democratic socialists, Bernie Sanders is a democratic socialist. He is not a social democrat. Uh, people like to throw the terms around as they're interchangeable. They're not. Social democrats are part of our history. Kyle Kasky okay. was the famous one. Democratic okay. Socialist, I would say Michael Harrington, the father of DSA. When he wrote all his books, The Other America, well, you should look at some of the books he wrote. 
the other America about poverty in America in the 70s. These people are democratic socialists. Social Democrats are part of our heritage. Democratic socialists are not. That's all I can spend the time on. Is SBUSA a workers' party? SBUSA is today. It was in the 30s. If you remember, we split. Communists split from the Socialist Party. It was a worker party then. The group that calls themselves Socialist Party today has nothing to do with the original. They use the same logo. They claim the same heritage, but they're nothing like it. The old Socialist Party had roots in the trade union movement, big roots in the Garment Workers Union in New York, for example. This group that calls itself Socialist Party is basically a group of intellectuals and college students. That's unfortunately, but that's what they are. What we think about the new left and the parties that want to stay on the quote-unquote left but reject Marxism, I'm asking if they will be included in the United Front. Yes, um, yes, theoretically, the yes, so theoretically, we could have a united front with groups like that. They could also be classified as okay. popular front groups because they're really not workers' parties. I see. They're really not. The new left is definitely not workers' parties. Herbert Marcuse in France, who they take after, these are not Marxists the way we know Marxists to be. So I would say it's more of okay. a popular front. Would we also consider Trotskyist organizations and parties to be workers' parties that we can... That's a good question. That's a good question. I think it depends on where their roots are. The Teamsters in the 30s, in Minneapolis, I believe it was, or Milwaukee, they were influenced by Trotskyites in the trade union movement. I would consider that a workers' party. But the Trotskyites who come out of the universities who don't have any connections with the working class. I don't see them as part of a workers' movement at all. I really don't. I think that's the name of the game, where we are. And that includes communists, too. There was a time when communists were part of the trade union movement. They were a workers' party. Now, I know in our party, in the PC, we're trying to get people to join unions. That without being a member of a union, it's hard to call yourself a worker to be honest with you. So I would say that's the culminating line of demarcation, where the party is involved in the labor movement. We have LUX, Labor United and Class Struggle. That's an attempt by us to really get involved with the labor movement. Social Democrats came out of the Second International before there was a Communist Party, before it was organized by Lenin. So they take the position that they are Marxist but not Leninist. And that is the big difference between them and us. And these people now, that around now, people like DSA that was formed by Michael Harrington are very anti-communist. They will not work with us on any level. So here we are talking about making a united front with organizations and the labor movement on the left And a lot of these people who are social democrats have positions in the labor movement. They control the labor movement and the AFL-CIO, and they also participate internationally in the anti-communist ITUC, which is the International Trade Union Congress, which was a split off from the WFDU, which is the legitimate trade union international movement. So what we have is a situation where it's not our choice to make. It's our desire to work with everyone against fascism. And that was the case in World War II. Before World War II, we wanted to organize the broadest possible movement of the working class against fascism. But in order to do that, you have to have the cooperation of the other side, of the people who are social democrats and the people who believe in capitalism. You have to have their support. If you don't have their support, it's very difficult to build a united front. So the only thing that we can do is propagandize for a united front 
to make the best case for a united front. But it's not our choice to make, it's their choice to make. All we can do is make the suggestion and push for that. That's a good That's point, it. Comrade. Good point. Yeah. Very good point. This next section is on sectarianism, which is a serious issue that we have to deal with. I'll just read something here from Dimitro, and then I'll summarize what he is saying. In the present situation, sectarianism, self-satisfied sectarianism, as we designate it in the draft resolution, more than anything else, impedes our struggle for the realization of the United Front. Sectarianism, satisfied with its doctrinaire narrowness, it is divorced from the real life of the masses, satisfied with its simplified methods of solving the most complex problems of the working class movement on the basis of stereotype scheme sectarianism, which professes to know all and considers it superfluous to learn from the masses, from the lessons of the labor movement, in short, sectarianism, to which, as they say, mountains are mere stepping stones. In other words, what Comrade Dimitrov is saying is that sectarianism is the greatest hurdle that we have to forming the United Front right now. We've got the DSA who refuses to work with us. We've got the Hoja parties like APL who we used to have good relations with who decided they don't like us because we refused to say that the Soviet Union was a Naziite state. We've got the Social Democrats who control the trade union movement right now. We have all these hurdles through sectarianism, controlling the masses and keeping them away from forming a united front with us. This is the main problem we have right now. This is the primary contradiction at the moment that we need to face, is the issue of sectarianism. This is what we need to focus on, is solving the problem of sectarianism so that we can build the united front. This is what Kama Dimitrov is saying. The situation may change. This is what Comrade Lenin has said, is that though the situation may change, the problems may change in their form, the primary contradictions remain the same in their general form. In other words, the sectarianism that existed at this point in time may not be exactly the same as it is today. The sectarianism then was in the Social Democrats in Germany, for example, refusing to work with the KDP because of differences that existed a hundred years ago, almost. Today we've got similar issues with the Social Democrats in the United States. It looks different, but it's really the same. I was going to read a paragraph from the heading Attitude Towards Bourgeois Democracy on page 87. But today, millions of toilers under capitalism are faced with the necessity of deciding their attitude to those forms, and those forms being the form of bourgeois government that exists, in which the rule of the bourgeois is not clad in the various countries. We are not anarchists, and it is not at all a matter of indifference to us of what kind of political regime exists in any given country whether a bourgeois dictatorship in the form of bourgeois democracy, even with democratic rights and liberties greatly curtailed, or a bourgeois dictatorship in its open fascist form. While we uphold the Soviet democracy, we shall fight to defend every inch of the democratic gains which the working class has wrested in the course of these years of stubborn struggle, and shall resolutely fight to extend those gains. And I think that ties in to what Comrade Angelo has said in the past of the current administration wanting to remove the velvet glove and put on the iron fist because in regards to the possibility of a united front with other parties, it's not the same to fight against fascism. It's not the same as to conspire with bourgeois democracy. And it, I think it's an important distinction. For a few minutes... I was supposed to summarize the idea of tonight's class. Tonight is the last night for this book. 
I think it's very important because the definition of fascism, according to Dimitrov, is the most reactionary, chauvinistic, these are his words, section of finance capital. That's the definition that Dimitrov gives. And I thought of Trump. What do I think of Trump? What's the slogan for Trump? Make America great again. If that's not chauvinistic in today's world, what is chauvinistic? To say that we have the best in the world of this, the best in the world of that. Remember, that started with Reagan. It went right on to Obama. He used the same words. And now we hear it again, Trump. The difference is that Trump is making it a keystone of his policy. Obama was hope, if everybody remembers, was let's have hope again. Reagan was a city on the hill, a shining city on the hill. This is very different. This is make America great again. Yesterday, he opened the doors to the Proud Boys. We all know what they stand for, white supremacy. So you add everything together, make America great again. It's a chauvinistic slogan. If you've ever been to any of the rallies, I hear the words, USA, 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 USA. Keep going, and eventually you'll see Deutschland über alles, Deutschland über alles, Deutschland über alles. To me, it's no different. Germany above all. America above all. The reactionary part of the administration is obvious. So it fits the definition in what Dimitrov calls fascism. It does not mean that, as in Germany, the trade unions were destroyed. The Communist Party was destroyed. That didn't happen until after Hitler took power in the election of 1933, when he was given by Hindenburg. He was given that. And by the way, Hindenburg was the head of the non-fascist movement among the wealthy in Germany, non-Nazi, N-O-N, non-Nazi. Because in a way, it's what the old party said, that liberals, social democrats, social democracy, basically leads to social fascism. So I think that that, what we studied in the 20s, it was not, as some people like to say, incorrect. I think it was correct for that period. It was correct for the 20s. After what they did to Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, the Social Democrats did lead the way to the street fightings against the communists, and they eventually even gave way to supporting Hindenburg, and Hindenburg eventually gave it to Hitler. So there is a direct correlation and a connection. So this idea that Trump is not a fascist is not really the question, in my opinion. The question is, what does he represent? And if he represents the most reactionary, chauvinistic, racist parts of the capitalist class, then that fits what Dimitrov was saying. The part you're leaving out, kind of important, is terror, the use of terror. It's not only chauvinistic, it's terrorist, according to the definition. And that is what forces supporting Trump are doing. They're terrorizing the peaceful people, encouraging them to provoke violence against them. And that is what it's the Proud Boys' purpose is to incite violence and terror. Some people call it domestic terrorism, and it's even connected to this fascist movement is interwoven with people who are supposedly acting alone. They're not acting alone. Timothy McVeigh did not act alone when he blew up the federal building and killed all those people. That was a fascist act of terror. And all of these people are connected. And that is why it's paramount for us to study United Front and what to do about that. Thank you. I just want to add one thing. I was talking to Comrade recently, 
And I said something to him, and I thought more about it. It is very historically correct. The people that voted for Hindenburg paved the way for Hitler. The people that vote for Biden, in my opinion, will eventually pave the way for someone like Trump. Because their policies, although stop fascism now, because they come out of saving capitalism, I feel that people like Biden and liberals eventually do pave the way for a fascist formation coming closer and closer to power in this country. And that's it. We ended the class. Now we're going to go to round robin. That last bit about liberals was particularly poignant. Just look at the history of it and also look at how they paint us in the modern media today. It's more likely, I would say, on on CNN and MSNBC mainstream, I guess you could say left in America, to paint us as brown shirts while actual brown shirts control the streets. We've discussed and said that liberals and social democrats have often paved the way for fascism and they kind of even sometimes do some of the heavy lifting for the fascists, like in Germany. But yet we can integrate them into a popular front. So does integrating them into a popular front with us prevent them from paving the way for fascism? It seems contradictory to me. Okay, that's, that's a good question. It does seem contradictory. It does. But the question is, how can we influence them? How can they be influenced to the point where they take that final step across the line? the line on demarcation between liberals and left-wing people. If we can get them to temporarily, and it's only temporary, comrades, temporarily the Soviet Union was on the same side as England and the United States to fight fascism around the planet, around the whole world. That didn't last long after the war ended. The reality changed again after World War II ended, 1945. And... The West went back to their normal way of operating, which is anti-communism, anti-Sovietism. So on the surface, it may look contradictory, but if you take into consideration the issue that times change and what was true yesterday may not be true today, which is what Marx tells us constantly, everything is changing, nothing stays the same. So then it doesn't become contradictory. For the moment, we can work with them in a popular front against fascism. Once fascism is gone, temporarily, they'll revert back to being our enemies again. I think that's obvious. I hope that gave some kind of answer. We have to understand the necessity in a united front or a people's front here in the United States. When you said liberals paved the way for fascism, I'm familiar with a leftist slogan that reminded me of Liberalism is jumping out of the plane. Fascism is hitting the ground. I know we've talked about whether or not Trump is a fascist more than once. And I just thought that the conversation about this has been kind of quaint because the Black Panther, George L. Jackson, was calling the United States fascist back in 1971. Yes, that's true. I think the only thing I'd have to contribute to it is saying that we need to start trying to forge more bonds and uh, start preparing to build a united front against the inevitable rise of fascism in the country. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you, Comrade. I think these past few classes really stresses that comrades should be reaching out locally to leftist and liberal organizations to try to form a united and popular front because the fascists are definitely gaining momentum in the country and everybody should be making the effort. And these past few classes have has really made me aware of that. I would like to highlight something that Comrade said. I really agree with how he characterized Trump. It's not even a question if he's a fascist. It's more about what he represents. And just because Trump doesn't have the mental capability of understanding something like fascism doesn't mean that he doesn't operate in that kind of fashion. So thank you. I recently tried telling a friend of mine that Trump is not a fascist, and they seem to have a hard time understanding the demarcation, and I feel like maybe I didn't do a good job explaining it to him. But one of the things I brought up was that we do not yet see the regimentation of our social life and our economy. Would you say that's probably one of the key lines between fascism and just far-right liberalism? Yeah, I would call it uh, reactionary 
centers of the ruling class instead of what you called it. But I see Trump as the man on the white horse. If nobody knows what that means, it's the person who comes before the fascism comes. It's the one who lays the way for fascism. It's famous in history, maybe as a historian. I'm one of the few people who heard about this theory, but it's common. It's the person with the white horse who comes before the actual situation, and he paves the way for it. And this guy fits the bill on everything I learned in history. In regards to the white horse, I watched a documentary that I would recommend, the 33 business plot that was designed to overthrow Roosevelt, and the American Liberty League, which was the fascist organization that organized it. And there, they actually referenced multiple times the man on the white horse that they would nominate. And that person was Smedley Butler. And he ended up exposing the whole thing. But this American Liberty League thought that fascism would be able to be paved the way through the man on the white horse, which would have been Smedley Butler to... Uh, very, very good. Uh, usurp the powers Excellent. Of, uh, Excellent. You taught me something. I didn't know where I read it or where I heard it from. That must have been it. That makes total sense, what you just said, comrade. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. I think it's very important. A lot of communists don't understand how we should interact with other sections of the political sphere. And I think the United Front really gave us a good solution that we should emphasize on teaming up with parties that share the same class interests. Thank you. This nation, I think, has always been at least a proto-fascist country. Hitler was directly influenced by how this nation genocided the Native Americans and how he should handle the Jews and the others. So, at least for the people of color, this nation has always been a fascist nation to me. Given that in 2014, Biden and the Democrats installed a Nazi regime in Ukraine, it was a racist, anti-working class, terroristic government. Are they not a th fascist threat as well? My opinion, they have a different agenda for this country than they do in their foreign policy. I think most of these people's foreign policy, including Clinton, including her husband, I think their foreign policy is more anti-communist and reactionary. In the case of what happened in Ukraine, I think they were definitely guided by anti-Russian sentiment. And I think it turned out that what happened in Kiev, they still have a facade of trade unions, a facade. I think it's a good analysis to study that in foreign policy, they'll have one agenda, but they wouldn't dare do that. Those kind of people wouldn't do it here yet. That's what I see, comrade. But there is a similarity. Just foreign policy and domestic is different. I agree with a lot of what comrades had said tonight. And I think one thing we should take away from it, reading like the last section that I was reading, when they were talking about what we have to defend, regardless of whatever the government is doing, that the United Front is built on working people seeing groups defending what rights they have. And we all know there's a lot of people that have been out there that are protesting all the stuff that's been going on. So we know they're out there, but we also know they're getting their information from liberal or new left or whatever kind of news sources and whatnot. They don't know how to get there, but they know they need to be protesting. That's what I think we should do as the United Front. Our focus on is reaching those people who want to be the change but are missing that key ingredient because they're blocked from knowing it from everybody else. If you look at U.S. foreign policy post-World War II, it's been extremely reactionary and definitely pro-fascist all over Latin America and developing nations. And if you look at something like the DHS, which was created to fight terrorism and then got turned loose on the citizens of Portland when they were trying to protest, I don't see how foreign policy won't just eventually come home. I think you're right. I think you're correct. Eventually, that's the key word. You're right. It's going to eventually come home. Yeah, I agree with you. Is there anything that we should be doing as internationalists in terms of the United Front at this point in time? That's a good question. I don't have the answer for that, but that's a good question. I think what we're trying to do right now is form alliances close through the International Department 
I can only speak of the PC. I can't speak of other groups. I don't know what they're doing. But that's the only thing that we can be doing right now. Good question. So I currently live in Burlington, Vermont, which, as most of you will know, is like Bernie Central. So I'm here with a lot of liberals and social democrats, we would consider them. Someone just asked this on a more broad level, what PC USA is doing. But on a more individual level, does anyone have any specific tips or strategies for trying to build the United Front? My response is the first thing you should do is meet in person with your club and discuss there among them because they'll know we have a club there. I suggest building MPD. MPD is great. You can work with all kinds of groups, groups to the left of you, groups to the right of you. And you don't have to have the discipline that you have when you're a member of a Marxist-Leninist party. There's a lot more to go through to get something going. If you do it through MPD, it's much easier. That's all I can suggest. Our work is cut out for us. We have a long way to go here. That's right. That's right. Long way to go. Thank you, comrade. When we're talking about United Front, a people's front, the Southern Negro Youth Conference that Comrade Esther Cooper Jackson, who is James Jackson's wife, was involved with. Also, I've heard Trump described as the Bonapartist, which, as I understand, is you know, the white horse. like that. And I remember now my studies. The man in the white horse originally came from the issue of Bonaparte in France. During that period, I cannot go further than that, but that's where I heard it first. But it makes total sense because he had a white horse. Everything that's happening is terrifying. And the fact how committed Trump supporters are to him, like he is infallible. And on top of him saying that he may not peacefully leave the White House, and I don't know, he's setting things up really bad with the standby comments and saying that he's not going to peacefully leave and already sowing doubt in the integrity of the elections, but none of this, none of this is good. On building sort of a popular front and the united front, what we're discussing at this point, I just wanted to share with you all that I received a letter from a young black man in prison in Vermont, and he sent me a beautiful card yesterday, a letter. And in it, he said that he's organizing behind bars to support our campaign for Congress because he said our campaign is committed to people of color and is committed to a transformation of the society. So I just wanted to say that our party is doing all the work that we should be and is uh, spreading the message now. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, comrade. Thank you for that. There's a lot we have to do. And due to circumstance, we might have to do a lot in a short amount of time. Really appreciated today's flag. It's very, very, very important. And I really liked hearing the news that Comrade of Vermont brought because this is no joke. And I really appreciated the sectarianism part because we're living in the imperial core and we don't have the doomsday clock. It's slowly, you know, taken away minute after minute. We're dealing with Palestinian kids who don't have homes. We have people getting, that's all our country directly in those affairs. You have Korean diaspora for displaced and all these different conflicts throughout the world are directly involved. So we have to get our act together and settle our differences for the better of mankind. Thank you for today. It was really good. Thank you. I'm going to close up the class. To build a communist party is new territory in this country. Remember that. So we make mistakes. And with that, I want to thank everybody. Good night.